facilities at the UT School of Public Health, but we also have our mobile units. So we have some mobile teaching kitchens that we actually go out into UT clinics or we go out into the community area. And then coming soon, we're gonna have our mobile teaching kitchen bus that will actually be out to go out to schools and um, various areas that we actually can't get to with our carts. Yeah, and I'll jump back in here. People always ask me, well, Wes, how did you get into nutrition? You're a chef, like, what, what's the point? You know, you go back to when I was about 14 or 15 years old, my, my grandfather, he had a heart attack. And I distinctly remember sitting at my grandparents' dinner table, my grandmother trying to get my grandfather to eat the, the healthy diet. And he said, doesn't taste good, I don't wanna eat it. It was as simple as that. It was a little more of an argument, but that was the, the essential discussion. And you know, as a child, I was saying, well, if I could just get healthy food to taste good, maybe I could help some of these outcomes. So you fast forward you know, 18 years, and that's why we're here. We're helping to teach medical doctors and, and medical students and dietitians how to communicate nutrition when it's food-based. Not the calories in, calories out, abstract information that doesn't make sense to people. It's the stuff that you, know, you eat every day. When you go to the grocery store, you buy food. You don't buy calories. So we talk about food. We talk about what's on your plate, what you eat, what you like, and how can we fit that into your diet to have you, help you have healthier outcomes. It's very realistic uh, you know, information. It's not the... The stuff that you just, you know, well, I can think I can, if I have a PhD, I can follow this, but, you know, it's stuff that everyone, you know, whether you're low income, low SES, you're, you know, you're the highest roller, whoever you are, you can follow the diet, you can follow and eat healthy. So that's really what we're doing, you know, kind of making a difference here in Houston and hopefully spreading this vision abroad. We have, which Ms. Moore didn't mention, we have several lectures going on uh, across the, the U.S. We have one in October coming up at FENCI, which is a national nutrition conference. And we're talking about our model. You know, we're spreading this out to, uh, you know, other areas to say, hey, you guys need to implement this in your city, whether it be in, you know, Indianapolis, Indiana, or, you know, wherever you are, you need to do it where you are and help your population. So, yeah, good. want to open it up for questions, maybe? I can keep talking. I, I'm talking about food. I can talk for the next 45 minutes, but I oh. would like some people to get some questions in. No, I, so can I. However, I think the questions are probably more important at this point, and we've got many, many of them. Okay. Uh, first question that's come in is, how do you eat healthily on a budget? This is a really good question, and it's something that often gets overlooked whenever you read diet recommendations. It's like, well, you have to eat organic this and you have to cook for six hours a night, et cetera. You know, and I have small kids. I'm a full-time student and I'm a full I have a full-time position, you know, working. I don't have much time on my hands. My wife, if she's watching right now, she would definitely say that. She's like, well, why aren't you home right now? So uh, again, um, we really focus on that. We understand that concept. So one of the things that we've been doing is is teaching people how to cook, you know, at a short time period and also on a short budget. So we use a lot of like dry beans and legumes. We also use we we'll use frozen vegetables. They don't have to be organic and, and fresh this, fresh that. We use things that are affordable and cost effective. Often when low income populations are actually shopping, they're shopping, you know, for a, a extended period of time. So they can't buy the produce. It, it ends up going to waste. So we teach people, well, if you can use some dried foods, you can use some, some vegetables, maybe you can get like an Instant Pot cooker and you can cook things a lot quicker. So we do have a lot of options and classes out there that we're offering now that help people. And again, our community classes are grant funded. We don't charge people for that. We believe that this information should be available to everybody. We want people to be able to eat healthy regardless if you can pay, pay for it or not. Great, uh, and for those of us, uh, those of you in, on our uh, live webcast, it is nourishprogram.org if you wish to sign up for the cooking classes at the UT Health School of Public Health. Second question, you mentioned legumes and dried food. This question is, do beans cause inflammation? Are they a healthy option? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I would definitely say no. Um, there might be, you know, again, when we're talking about inflammation, we're talking about things that have a little bit higher omega-6 ratio. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get too technical to, to, to everybody's question, but they have a lot of fiber. They're really good for you. Uh, they're things that we should be consuming. They're things we should be eating. Uh, most people are not eating enough fiber uh, based on the recommendations. So we tell people, eat your beans. They're good for you. They're also a low-cost option, and they have a lot of protein in them. Yeah. So th these are really good things for people that might be more vegetarian um, or, you know, more vegan, et cetera. So definitely eat your beans. They're good for you. If you're, if you're thinking about inflammation, I would probably say it's the potato chips or the cookies that are causing more of a problem. <laughs> Not the legumes. 
<laughs> uh, next question. What is the best thing to eat before I work out? And then what's the best thing to eat after I work out? Well, he's the trainer, so we'll let him talk on that one. Sorry. It depends on your workout. Um, yeah. <laughs> most people are consuming way too many calories before workout. You know, we exercise and you're like, well, let me back up. Has anyone run a 5K? I would say yes. Someone on the TV has run a 5K. I'm sorry, I keep asking questions for people that are on the air. I apologize. Um, essentially, if you go to a 5K on the weekend, you see people eating pizza right after they ran three miles, okay? And they're downing two, three beers, and they have, you know, a Gatorade, and they're dying, and they're like, I ran three miles. You didn't burn that many calories. So it depends on the type of workout you do. If you're really yeah, exercising fine. hard, you might need to have more carbohydrate intake before. A lot of pro not a lot of protein, some protein, some fat. Um, during, if you're doing an extended over 60 minutes, you usually will need to consume some type of carbohydrate beverage and or gel, et cetera, while you're running. If it's a shorter than 60 minute exercise period, you don't really need to eat anything. And you don't need some post-workout shake or anything like that. You can eat real food. You eat food. That's, that's what we need. We don't need something that's on a shelf that's been there for three years. Eat, eat food that, that's Definitely. good for you. it's good for you. Excellent. Is there any value in juicing? <laughs> well, I think juicing can be good for a snack, but not as a meal replacement. When you juice, you lose a lot of your nutrients. You lose fiber and you lose uh, other good vitamins and minerals. Um, so it's better to eat the whole fruit um, and juice in between. Yeah, I mean, you, you picture it like it's a, a roller coaster. It's going super fast in your, your bloodstream, so you definitely don't want to just take the juice in and eat the whole fruit. It, yeah, you can use like a, a Vitamix or some, and just blend it all up, and that way you don't lose the fiber. You don't lose all of the pulp, the things that are good for you. Definitely. Great. Uh, how does one lose weight when they are diabetic? Mm -hmm. Let, let's assume they are working out, uh, doing walking daily. You need, we can both discuss this because yeah. I think we both think would so. have something to add to this, but. You know, it depends on the level of diabetics you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you have really uncontrolled diabetes, you have to be cautious. If you're taking insulin, for instance, and you lose weight drastically or eating things, you have to be realistic. But it's, it's similar to the other approaches. I mean, your other populations where you're eating a healthy diet, you know, Mediterranean-style dietary pattern. You're consuming those types of foods and then combined with exercise. We, we advise people not just diet it has to be combined with exercise. We think both work, and exercise alone doesn't just work either. They need to all work. Well, and diabetics need to pay attention to their carbohydrate and the carbohydrate consumption primarily. And so that plays a role. And again, like Wes says, it depends on where you are, if you're type two, type one, or where you are on your medication yeah. as far as what you eat. And, and for, specific an for specific questions like that, definitely refer to your physician or a dietitian you might be working with. Certified diabetes educator. Yes, certified <laughs> diabetes educator, definitely. Oh, God. Uh, okay, uh, next question coming in. These are some good questions, too, so thank you guys for sending these in. Keep texting them in, this is fun. Lately, you can stay until 10 if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Lately, I'm seeing that nightshade vegetables aren't good for you such as tomatoes, peppers, potatoes, eggplant, can you comment? You can thank the famous Tom Brady for that one. So uh, Tom Brady is playing football now, he's what, 41 or something? So if he's doing it, then that means it's good for all of us, right? No, that's an anecdotal uh, advice and that's why it's happening. This was popular about 15, 20 years ago. Again, less than 10% of the adult population is eating the vegetables that we need to eat. Telling people not to eat vegetables is a, is a bad idea in, in, in my mind. And you, eat your vegetables. You lose some great nutrients. Yeah, I mean, you don't get to eat tomatoes. tomatoes. Like, you don't get to eat eggplant. Those are wonderful vegetables that taste great. So, again, like... Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm sorry I thought you were still answering. What is, why are we now hearing so much uh, is bad about dairy? I'm assuming this questioner may be talking about either lactose intolerance or uh, the high fat content. So there's a, you know, nutrition is a, a new field. I want to start off saying that. I mean, we haven't been around that long studying this stuff. A lot of the trials that are that are out there, the studies that are out there, are observational, meaning they're they're following. They they look at people. It's a snapshot in time. Some of this new information is coming out. We're seeing things that are you know, showing some different things than we thought. <clears throat> For instance, 
we used to tell people eat low fat dairy, you know, like that's the best thing for you. Well, then we realized when you're, you give people low fat dairy, you often put sugar in it. When you put sugar in it, that's not good for you. So if you go and you look at yogurt that's low fat for kids, it has like 30, 26 grams of sugar in it. That's really not a good thing. So what we're seeing now is, well, maybe we should tell people eat the, the whole fat because it, it does have a better mouthfeel. Some people like it more. If you're consuming, which someone came up to me and talked about this a little earlier, if you're consuming a low-fat milk and it doesn't have a lot of added sugar in it, there's nothing wrong with that. And if you like it, well, that's what you're going to consume anyway, so stick to that. Great. Is, uh, I've, always been, I've always taken a multivitamin daily. Is this still good advice? Well, we recommend whole vegetables and fruits um, to meet your daily needs of your vitamins and minerals. It certainly doesn't hurt to take a multivitamin, but supplements, for the most part, aren't regulated. Yeah, they're, they're definitely not regulated. And then you want to stay clear of megadosing. Uh, for lack of a better term, it's expensive urine. So we don't want to go that route. <laughs> And this one involves uh, uh, the hot topic of probiotics and prebiotics. Are these necessary? And should I buy them? And, or how can I just eat them? Well, I think they can, they, they can be helpful. Um, you find them in yogurt and uh, kefir and kombucha. Um, they're very easy to find. They're also, you can find them in, in pill form, actually, in the refrigerated section. Um, they balance out the good, the good bacteria and the bad bacteria, so to speak. Um, do you need it? Uh, if you're having digestive problems, mm -hmm. it's definitely something that you can consume. Um, and prebiotic is essentially the food for the probiotic, which the probiotic is a bug, you know, bacteria, good bacteria. bacteria. So prebiotic is essentially just a, like a longer chain carbohydrate that's going to get into your system and feed that bacteria in your gut. Um, a lot of that stuff that's like in powder form that you buy maybe at Whole Foods or something like that, uh, I would avoid purchasing those items. Just consume real food and it, you know, that has fiber in it, and that will serve as a prebiotic. You don't need to purchase it. Well, and, right. yeah, and actually the probiotics, they're actually live. So mm -hmm. they're live bacteria along with yeast. So if you're finding a, a dried form, it's probably not the, not the real thing. Yeah. What are some of the foods that contain um, or, or promote the growth of good bacteria that we can consume? Fiber. Fiber. Anything that contains yeah. fiber. So vegetables. Banana. So sauerkraut, vin the vinegar craze. You, you can do things like that, but again, if you're if you're having a varied diet with fiber in it, then that is what is going to promote a good, healthy gut, and that is what literature has shown us now. The we, we've you know our diet has definitely changed over the past several hundred years. We need to get back to eating more things that contain fiber, more real foods, not packaged products on the shelf. Why are fruits so good for you if they are so loaded with sugar? <laughs> this goes back to that juicing question, and you yeah. can jump into this yeah. too. But um, again, they have sugar, but it also is wrapped up in other stuff. Fiber, all this other stuff in the... So I have, I have an orange. Well, that's not going to work because here, here's an apple. All right, so you take the juice out of this. Uh, you, eat a, you drink an 8-ounce glass of orange juice, or apple juice here, sorry. That takes, what, like seven of these small apples? Are you going to eat seven of these? Probably not, okay? That's where the juicing, so much sugar. They have sugar, but they have fiber, et cetera. View the fiber as like a, a break to the car. It's slowing down the sugar absorption. Um, and that's actually a serving size of an apple, yeah. The Mediterranean diet always makes sense to me, but it sure is loaded with a lot of fat. Yeah, it, you know, it promotes healthy fats, though. You know, we're, we're not talking about just taking a scoop of lard and putting that on a plate. You know, it's, it's things that, that we, you know, uh, in, in the forms of, you know, healthy fish, the forms of uh, nuts and seeds, the forms of olive oil, other healthy oils that are good for you. And, and one of the things, if you go on a, a lower fat diet, well, you, you don't get full as often, you know, so you're eating more food that might not, you know, be healthy for you, especially packaged products or things that don't have fiber in them. So yes, it has a higher um, uh, fat content, but it's not necessarily a, uh, a bad thing. It's definitely better than the average American diet. Good. Can a person eat too much good fat? Yeah, you can. Yes. Eat, I mean, you can definitely eat too much ice cream. Right? Ice cream, not just a good fat, but it's a good thing. It tastes great, right? You yeah. can definitely eat too much. You drink a bottle of olive oil; it's definitely too much for sure. I mean, they ha they have the same calorie count, 
So uh, yes, you can you can eat too much good fat. Yes, definitely. Which leads to another question on ice cream. <laughs> The newer ice creams contain almond milk, cashew milk, coconut milk, this milk, that milk. Are these better than regular cow's milk? So, um, and I think both of us can answer this, but um, I just keep talking. <laughs> it's okay. I talk a lot, I'm sorry. Uh, essentially, a lot of the other alternative milks out there have a lot of fillers in them. So they're using thickeners to give it the same consistency as milk. And they might not even contain the protein that milk contains. So if you're buying a bottled almond milk, how many almonds are really went into making the almond milk? Um, I would argue that a lot of them are not as good for you as uh, cow's milk. Uh, again, some people like the flavor of almond milk. That's fine, consume it. I don't, so I wouldn't, but that's my own personal feelings. Other people really like soy milk. So is it bad for you? No, it's not bad for you, but it's, it might not necessarily be the, you know, equate to equal. And they may not have the same vitamins and minerals in them. You may have missed them. When you hear that coffee is good for you in moderate doses, are they talking about the caffeine or the other ingredients in coffee? What is it that is good for you per the recent literature? For my sake, I hope they're talking about some of the caffeine because I definitely <laughs> drink a lot. You know, I have small kids and I'm in school, so I, I do drink a lot of coffee. But they're talking about the antioxidants yes. and the polyphenols, polyphenols. Um, that are good for you. Okay. Is a pure vegetarian or vegan diet proven to be more clinically sound, more healthy, than a diet with some animal protein and dairy? Well, um, honestly, we, we do focus on plant-based diets, but um, the vegan diet is highly restrictive. And um, if you're not careful, you're gonna miss some vitamins and minerals and things, um, B12, for instance, um, and you have to be sure and supplement your diet with those. Yeah, I mean, I wanna be realistic too. like. I'm from southern Alabama, we're in Houston, Texas. If I told the majority of the population, you need to eat vegetarian or vegan, what's gonna happen? No one's gonna follow my advice. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's good things about vegetables, like I said, but also we have to be realistic. We just need to, our, our, our normal plates, the steak takes up the majority of the portion, or the chicken, or whatever it is, even if it's fish. We need to flip that plate and make the vegetables more of the, the eye of the plate um, and then still have the meat you know I enjoy meat uh, myself again that's personal but uh, I don't think it's a good advertisement just to, to tell people just avoid meat altogether it's not necessarily bad it's just the overconsumption of meat that's really a, a big problem as far as clinically well and we also focus on the my plate yep. so half the plates fruits and vegetables then you have a quarter protein and your quarter grain and a quarter what grain grain mm -hmm. Can you, can you talk a bit about the grains? Uh, the new grains have come in. They're fashion, all old grains, but they're really old grains. Oh, well, it's, it's, yes, the little black dress of grains from last season is now, you know, anything from. Our ancient from, grains, right? Right. They're, they're ancient new grains. I don't, I don't know what that means, the but they are. The ancient new grains, which would you recommend for uh, those who are trying to experiment with different grains besides rice, Couscous, uh, et cetera. And again, we're going to both answer this question because I think both of us differ on our, our flavor opinions. Uh, it really goes back to flavor. What, you, mm -hmm. what do you like? What do you enjoy? Mm -hmm. Make sure it's a whole grain. Uh, a good example of that is brown rice versus white rice. Uh, it needs to be the brown, not the white. Uh, if it's a whole grain, feel free to consume it. And the way you'll be able to tell that is if you look on the back of the package and it says whole grain on there, that means whole grain. And make sure that it has, the, uh, it has enough fiber in there. I typically tell people at least three grams per serving. Yesterday in the Houston Chronicle, a cardiologist from out of town, so no problem here, <laughs> one who will not be named, challenged the current climate that red meat and saturated fats are, are, are not all that bad based on prior studies, which I'm saying the opposite, prior studies showing that uh, red meat and saturated fats uh, are a detriment to our health. So what is the current research? Go ahead. Yeah. Again, I think that's kind of a semantic argue, uh, argument. Um, less than 10% of the adult population is consuming vegetables. That's the problem. We keep getting away from that. Why are people not eating healthy? 
ask yourself that question. It's probably because it doesn't taste good. We're, we're going to consume the meat. People are going to do that. I, I don't think that that is really that big of a problem right now. We need to focus on the bigger picture, the elephant in the room per se. Mm -hmm. But we do, we do focus on the Mediterranean style of, of eating, and it does allow for lean proteins. And so it is a part of our diet. It's something that we, we do recommend. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit about cooking methods and health? Are high temperatures, uh, high temperatures like in grilled or blackened foods that bad and why? Is slow cooking healthier? Um, you know, there's some literature out there that says, you know, super high heat methods can be bad for you. Um, you know, again, what is, it, what is it that you're actually cooking, though? I think that's more of the problem. If, mm -hmm. if you're roasting vegetables and it's at a higher temperature, well, you're roasting vegetables. That's not as, you know, it's a good thing. You're still eating. It's getting you to eat them. Um, and that's often how we get people to, say, eat a sweet potato or Brussels sprouts. To roast has, them. It, has anybody, again, boiled Brussels sprouts? They're pretty nasty. <laughs> uh, roasted Brussels sprouts are delicious. Uh -huh. So, again, not thinking about the cooking methods as much. Focus on what really tastes good. Frying would be a bad thing because it's submerged in oil mm -hmm. and you're really consuming a lot of excess fat that way. Um, as far as the other high heat methods, as long as you're using an oil that's not going to overeat, uh, go too much higher than its smoke point, you should be fine because then you're not um, really breaking down the oil. Yeah, your vegetable oils. And using a grill pan just to grill something instead of actually charring it uh, over charcoal, right? Yeah. Can you, uh, we're going to take a couple of more questions and then uh, uh, thank you all for, for let, letting, we're going to now let you visit with the live audience, uh, much to the chagrin of the web, webosphere. So uh, one of the last questions involves celiac disease. What, what is a broad-based recommendation for someone with celiac? Well, I think first of all, um, they have to be diagnosed professionally to make sure it is celiac because there are some out there who have an intolerance um, to uh, wheat or to gluten in general. It's a, it's a family of proteins, um, but it's everything in moderation. It's there's a trend of either yeah, and if you if you jump on the gluten free bandwagon, often uh, people that truly have celiacs, yes, that you need to Definitely do that. You would have problems and you need to follow a gluten-free diet. However, a lot of people think they have um, gluten intolerance. And I'll use a personal example. I had a friend that said, you know, I think I'm gluten intolerant. Uh, you know, I've really had a lot of bloating, et cetera. I uh, said, so, well, what did you eat? You know, well, I had six pieces of pizza. Well, I think it might be the six <laughs> pieces of pizza. It wasn't the gluten. I think you're blaming the gluten for your overconsumption. So I'm not saying that that's the case for everybody, but also be realistic of what you, what are you actually consuming? Mm -hmm. Is it tons of food and that's why your stomach doesn't feel all right? Or is it, you know, really the gluten? And if you're eliminating wheat, rye, or barley, for that most part, you think about your, what B vitamins you're actually eliminating if it's just a trend. And there's a lot of packaged products available now. So people are purchasing, mm -hmm. you know, gluten-free products. Are they really, are gluten-free cookies healthy? I would argue no, they're cookies, you know. <laughs> might, be, might not have gluten on, but, you know, they're still cookies. Uh, one, uh, I'm going to ask the last question will be about two things that are always in the news. One is sugar, one is uh, the recent uptick in turmeric and some of the Indian spices in particular. The first question, is there a difference between turbinado, uh, organic sugar, white sugar, bleach sugar, uh, I, I won't say brown sugar because we know that that has molasses in it, but it, is there a difference in nutritional value of the various sugars that look really good next to the cup of coffee at your favorite uh, baristas hang out. <laughs> sugar, sugar, sugar. sugar. Um, Agree. That apply to honey. Let me. Um, I want to add honey to that yeah. and agave. You know, and the new dietary recommendations are are looking at added sugar, which is a big mm -hmm. problem. Naturally occurring sugars in foods are not as big of a deal for us because they have the other things like I talked about fiber. You know, like in a fruit. Um, when you're adding sugar, whether it be some marketing scheme is like invert turbinado. Uh, evaporated cane juice, this, that, whatever it is, is still sugar. Um, 
honey is a natural sugar, but it is still sugar. Yeah. It's not processed. And they have some different <laughs> chemical makeups. Some of them might have more glucose and more fructose in them, mm -hmm. et cetera. But again, it's still, at the end of the day, it's added sugar. Mm -hmm. And that's a concern. Thank you. Uh, the last question, as I said, would be more about some of the uh, more uh, trendy uh, spices that we are seeing in the news, turmeric, uh, cocor, all, all the, the wonder, wonderfully flavored foods, but is there a, as in nutrition in medicine, is there an anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, anti this will kill me, <laughs> quality by, by using some, by using these I mean I don't think it's a magic pill of anything but yeah. definitely all these spices are wonderful I'm a mm. chef like I use them I advise people to use them we should use them uh, they taste wonderful so why not and, the and color. if they benefit the you then definitely the color you know, and the antioxidant yeah. if you look at mustard if you look at the back of your mustard jar yellow mustard most of them are <laughs> colored with turmeric so you know the, the concept of con consuming turmeric is great Put it in your food, though. Don't take it in a pill form, you know? Yeah, Go get some and actually cook with it. Taste and see if you like it. Um, definitely use all the spices you can. Adding it to cauliflower. Yeah, it's beautiful, Really, really too. pretty. Thank you both so very much. I, Laura and Wes, this was such a treat for us. Kermit the Frog was wrong when he said it's not easy being green. It's the easiest thing in the world, apparently. Thank you for nourishing our curiosity about our health. And remember, everyone, you can sign up for actual cooking classes with Laura and Wes at nourishprogram.org. I'd also like to thank uh, our, our wonderful folks here, our interns with the uh, dietetic program who are typing as fast as they can for the questions that we were not able to get to tonight. And certainly a huge thank you goes to our kind and general, generous hosts at Mercedes-Benz West Houston who have made this evening possible. And ABC 13 for giving us a platform to supply our Houston community with knowledge and awareness regarding our health. And I'd also like to extend our gratitude to UT physicians, our partners in health, our clinical faculty, uh, who teach, train, treat, and are learning how to cook better so that they can advise their patients. Tonight was the fifth of seven UT Health House calls. Our next one will cover stem cell therapies, and that occurs on Thursday, October 11th at Mercedes-Benz of Houston, Greenway. For more information about UT Health House calls, please visit the Health Check section on abc13.com, and of course, you can also review uh, tonight's uh, information by going to abc13.com. This will be up for, for several days. Thank you all, and we look forward to seeing you next time.